Good morning, Pittsburgh. I'm your host, Taylor Fife. And I'm Royce Jones. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Daybreak. Our top stories this morning start with a new update on Amazon's decision to choose their new headquarters. And new opportunities around at this year's spring internship fair. Wake up, Pittsburgh, because here comes Daybreak. Now, if there's one thing that is true, it's that the weather in Pittsburgh has been very brutal lately. We had, um, what, a high of 60, 60 something on Monday, and then just yesterday it was snowing and in the 20s. Right, you know what, Taylor? I just can't get used to it. Right. I'm hoping for some type of solid weather right. that I just know what to expect. Exactly. It's always up in the air here. Right, in I Pittsburgh. just want it to stay cold. <laughs> if it's going to be cold. <laughs> Me too. Well, you know, we have another, uh, actually, would you, what would you call them? Throwback? So yeah, throwback, familiar face. Yeah. All right. Well, we have Alex Grubbs over at the weather station who's going to tell us all about the Pittsburgh weather. I guess I'm back, and I guess it is a bit of a throwback. And I know you're expecting that the weather this week might be better than it was, but guess what? It's just going to be exactly how it was. If you look today, we're going to have a nice sunny day, some clouds out in the 50s, and the temperatures will stay around the high 40s throughout the weekend. But it's going to be rainy, as you see here. And, but as Sunday comes around, we'll have that sun. But as the week rolls up, we're going to go back and plummet back down to the cold. If you see here on Monday, we're going to have snow again, 35 degrees. So you see that dramatic shift in weather. As we move into the rest of the week here on Tuesday, it will be sunny, but it's still going to stay in the low temperatures. And as you go towards the rest of the week, it should go back up to the high 40s. But come on, it's Pittsburgh. What can you expect? The weather, it's either warm, it's cold. And we're at that time of the year where it's just going to be sporadic for all of, you know, the rest of the spring and probably going into the end of the semester. So, well, when we start the school week on Monday, just be sure to bundle up because, you know, snow is still here, but by the end of the week, I guess it'll be somewhat warm again. So you can get your jean jacket out for the week, Taylor and Royce. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I'll make sure to dust off my <laughs> denim jacket. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, here's your city and campus news. New parameters are being set for talks between Amazon and Pittsburgh. The retail giant gets as getting close to signing a deal for its second headquarters. CEO of the Alleg Allegheny County Conference of Community <coughs> Development, Steffi Stephanie Pashman, told the Trib, Amazon wants her and her team members to sign a non-disclosure agreement, keeping quiet about the selection process and progress and limiting only one representative from the PGHQ2 team to discuss further development with the company. Amazon is tightening up on the competition too, narrowing the selection down to their top 20 choices, including the Steel City, a stretch from the original 238 bids from cities around the country. Officials have identified the body of a man found dead in his car outside of a local supermarket nearly a week ago. According to the Trib, 32-year-old Joshua Nord of Sharpsburg was discovered in his vehicle around 4 p.m. last Wednesday outside of the Walmart at the Pittsburgh Mills Mall in Fraser. Now, police say Nord was in his car for an extended period of time and may have been found sooner. The store normally does routine checks throughout the parking lot, which were more than likely postponed due to the extreme weather conditions. Police are still investigating the cause of his death. Toys R Us is expected to close over 180 of its locations nationwide, among them several here in the Pittsburgh area. The toy retailer filed documents this past Tuesday stating that it's closing 182 of its locations amid filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, according to USA Today. The company did say, however, that some stores listed for closing may stay open if a cheaper lease agreement can be negotiated. In a letter to the, uh, on the company's website, rather, CEO David Brandon thanked customers customers for their loyalty and support and left them with an encouraging reminder that the retail will st still operate both online and in major cities across the country. Among those closing locations in our area are the Ross Township, Monroeville, Beaver Valley and Washington locations. Point Park University's police department launched their new police blotter through an announcement made on their Facebook page on January 16th. According to the department's Facebook post, the police blotter will be updated weekly in order to keep students informed about the department's activity on campus. The police blotter can be seen on the public safety page on the university's website 
or by clicking on the police blotter link that will be included in a weekly post on their Facebook page. It's almost time for the Spring Internship and Job Fair. According to the university's Career Development Center, the event will be held on February 8th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Student Center Gym. A recent email sent to students by the Career Development Center states that more than 60 employers hiring for jobs and internships will be there. All majors are welcome to attend, and students are encouraged to dress professionally and bring their updated resumes. You can register for the event at pointpark.joinhandshake.com. Now I do have a special treat in store for you all if you're looking for an opportunity to give back to others. The Honors Program at Point Park is selling daffodils that are, will benefit the American Cancer Society. You can buy $10 for $10 or donate uh, $25 to purchase a gift of hope, which will anonymously deliver uh, daffodils to a hospital patient or a patient in a nursing home. So if you're looking uh, to participate in that, you can go to the Honors Program office. It's on the fourth floor of Lawrence Hall, now through February 2nd. Awesome, Taylor. Yeah. Can't wait. I, I I'm going to have to get involved in that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right, well, there's what's happening around your city and campus. After the break, an update for all of you basketball fans. And how has the government shutdown affected you? You won't want to miss this. Stay tuned for Daybreak. One word to describe cab. Welcoming. Community. Creative. Experiences. Family. Openness. Pineapple. The Campus Activities Board is a student-run organization that consists of seven different committees. Each focuses on event planning, marketing, and administrative activities. Join us in organizing the juiciest events on campus from late night bingo to festive dances to our team bonding meetings. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Point Park Cap or like us on Facebook at Campus Activity Board at Point Park University. Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. I'm Josh Krupp alongside Jess Patterchak. Defending his decision to kick out 15 Cuban diplomats from the United States. Thanks, Allison. Fitness on Demand has returned to Point Park. Residents fear that Mount Agung will have a repeat of 1963's eruption. Two-star NFL quarterbacks made the headlines this week after wrapping up. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. That's your news tonight. For Nick Tomarello, I'm Alex Grubbs. Have a great night. Welcome back to Daybreak. Jeff Dalkum here with everything you need to know in sports. Cleveland Cavaliers LeBron James reached a major milestone on Wednesday in a game against the San Antonio Spurs. James now finds himself in elite company as he becomes the seventh player in NBA history to score 30,000 points. The four-time NBA MVP and three-time finals champion became the youngest player to join the prestigious club at the age of 33, a year and 80 days before Kobe Bryant. James also becomes the only player in the NBA history with over 30,000 points, 7,000 assists, and 7,000 rebounds. James con congratulated himself on an Instagram post before Wednesday's game. The post reads, want to be the first to congratulate you on this accomplishment slash achievement uh, meant tonight with you that you'll reach. Only a handful has reached slash seen it too. There's so many people to thank who has helped this even become possible. So thank them all. So with that said, congrats again, Young King. You can find his entire post on Instagram on our Facebook, Daybreak on UView. So much. Well, um, how about uh, LeBron James? Do you have any more information about that for us? LeBron right now, you know, the Cavaliers, they're kind of struggling. Um, and, and uh, you know, this is, this is a hard season. So they're going through some things. They're, they're actually looking at making some big trades to be able to compete with the Golden State Warriors. Um, so that's something to look forward to for all the basketball fans. 
That's it for sports. Let's ho head over to the Daybreak News Desk with Nick Tomarello. Nick, what do we need to know in national news? Thanks, Jeff. The three-day government shutdown came to an end on Monday after Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell negotiated with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, pledging to allow an immigration vote on DACA in the coming weeks. President Trump rescinded DACA in September, giving Congress until March 5th to make a replacement. DACA, short for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, allows dreamers who were brought to the United States illegally be allowed to remain in the country. Trump also required that money for the Mexico-United States border wall be included in any package brought to his desk. According to the New York Times, a source said that Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer discussed Friday funding the border wall in exchange for an agreement from Trump to support the legalization of Dreamers. But this deal fell short after President Trump and his chief of staff, John Kelly, demanded more concessions on immigration. Vox News also noted in an article that President Trump is the first president to have a government shutdown with a party majority in both the House and the Senate. The spending bill will last until February 8th, giving both Republican and Democratic congressmen and women only two weeks to write a better pr pr proposal. Excuse me. And finally, a shooter at a Kentucky high school injured 18 students and killed two others on Tuesday. The 15-year-old suspect is in custody and will be charged with murder and attempted murder. According to local police, 15-year-old Bailey Nicole Holt died at the scene and 15-year-old Preston Ryan Cope died later at the hospital. 14 other students were shot and four others were injured as they fled the scene. According to multiple reports, there have been at least 10 school shootings in 2018. Nick, such a tragic story you're reporting here. Are there any new developments out of this? Yes, Royce, there actually is. The 15-year-old suspect was seen in court on Thursday, and now they are talking about charging him as an adult. So with that being, if they do charge him as an adult, his name will be released. Because he is in juvenile court now, that's why we don't know the suspect's name, but it is another 15-year-old student at that school. Well, that's all for national news. I'll give it back to the couch with Royce and Taylor. Nick, thank you. Just up ahead, another segment of Down the Road with Delaney. We'll see Nick Tomarello again whenever he is right next to Delaney on that road. All right, this and much more coming up ahead. T, 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 why should you watch and focus? Because, why not? Turn, 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 turn. Why should you watch and focus? Because I produce it. Welcome to In Focus. Hello. This is so we don't run out of time. Put up a goal, just right. because it. And a little bit closer, please. Let me bring this in. Yeah. I wanted to do a game. Oh, so, right. uh, game time. Our oh, game hey. over. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did we get that? There he is. Why are you watching Focus? Why are you watching Focus? Because the Focus is great. Chris! Oh! Uh, game time! Game time! It's not game time! It's a promo! Start, Start your morning, morning with, with us. us. I'm your host, Jess Patercheck. And I'm your host, Alex Gross. Good morning and welcome to another episode that is what happened of Daybreak. The I'm your host, WPXI. The state wants to take $357 million dollars out of a Trump summer 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 that typically that wintry mix stuff could get me. I'm going care for you, you, you. What up? The diva himself. <laughs> Only on Daybreak. 55% of all U.S. multiracial adults have been subjected to racial slurs or jokes. Where were you born? Being smart Pale, to for a Filipino, Filipino to be go white. back to Mexico. There goes that black boy over there. You like fried chicken because you're light skinned. You are a cock. You think that you're better than us. The N word. They get a jumping or climbing border hopper. Made taco. English your second language. Where's your green card? Cut the jokes. Stop the stereotypes. Welcome back to Daybreak and welcome to Down the Lane with Delaney. I'm your host Delaney and this week I have my guest Nick back. He did national earlier so welcome back. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about the Larry Nassar case, and because he was just sentenced yesterday to 40 to uh, 175 years, excuse me, in prison for sexual abuse of over 150 women who came to testify over a seven-day period. So, what are your thoughts on this whole entire case? I think it's long overdue, and the fact that now he's getting punished. Um, it's such a sad thing and what he has done to multiple women mm -hmm. and girls for that matter. I remember reading, I believe the youngest girl was six years old. That's what I read as well. The youngest was age six. And um, just, just to hear um, what they were saying in some of their testimonies, um, it just really struck, struck a nerve with me um, because just I couldn't even imagine what they went through. And right. especially someone that they were so connected with, a lot right, of right. They them trusted him. Trusted mm -hmm. him, and um, you know he was a renowned doctor across the world. So you know the fact that you build that trust and that family trust, that mm -hmm. family bond, um, it was it's just really really sad. Yeah. Right. No, I completely agree. Um, this had been happening. They said for over thirty years. It happened um, with the USA Gymnastics, and it happened at Michigan State University according to the testimonies and originally it was supposed to be only four days of testimonies and then more women kept coming forward saying I want to testify I want to speak to him because the judge did allow them to speak directly to him in court and so like I said over 150 women actually spoke to him and then it lasted seven whole days mm -hmm. they also um, said a lot of people are saying how the judge crossed the line almost by saying she said quote I just signed your death warrant because of the long imprisonment do you think she crossed the line, or do you think she was just being emotional and saying how she felt? Because that's how a lot of people felt. Personally, I can understand when, mm -hmm. you know, having those emotional feelings, especially in a case just like that. But I also do believe that someone in power just like her in, in the position that she is as a judge, um, even though no matter what your personal opinion is and no matter what horrific crimes the person that's being charged um, committed or is accused of committing, I do believe that there needs to be some sense of decorum and truth and honor and respect both sides. Um, obviously, you have your personal opinion and Correct, yeah. your own, what you want to do with the sentencing and stuff like that. But um, I just think that, at least for judges in a sense, they do need to be more fair in a way. A little more neutral. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and I know it's crazy, you know, just me thinking about saying that, it's crazy because of the terrible things that right. go on he's in this Right, he's a horrible world. human being, yes. And, and so it's just, you know, the thing about our democracy and our country and the right to a free trial and the, trial, excuse me, and the right to be heard mm -hmm. um, definitely needs to um, be done. Exactly. No, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, they also said that some of these women were abused at Michigan State University while he was a medical doctor there. He was not only a doctor there for the USA gymnastic, or Gymnastics there, but other teams as well. Um, and because of that, Lou Anna Smith, the university president, actually stepped down on Wednesday because of the sentencing. Um, and the NCAA announced that they're going to do a investigation into the program to see what happened with the Title IX. Do you think that law enforcement should handle that or that the NCAA should take that into their hands and continue their investigation? Now, I can understand why the NCAA would want to investigate it, but again, with the stakes of this type of case being so high, um, personally, I think maybe the they could work together in a sense. Mm -hmm. The police should, I would say, take more of charge of it um, but I understand why the NCAA would want to maybe work together with them try to understand what's going on better um, but yeah I think the police should probably be the ones to take charge on it no I agree from what I understand from what I've been reading the NCAA doesn't have as many rules set in place to handle things like this they don't really have correct punishments um, would probably be how I would say to handle the higher-ups who probably received these Title IX actions um, and ignored them or whatever they did with them. 
And I think that law enforcement should do that because they will be more neutral. This isn't mm -hmm. their school. They're not who they're representing. So they need to handle that to be more neutral, make it a fair punishment. So no, I completely agree. And because she resigned, do you think more people are going to start resigning, like the USA Gymnastics Board? I think that there are people that need to answer for what they didn't do. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that allegations have run, been brought up years ago against him. Mm -hmm. And now that it's happening, as I said before, the fact that it's happening now is uh, quite concerning. Right, no, I agree. Like, Because like I said earlier, it's been happening for what they say is 30 plus years, multiple locations. The USA Gymnastic cut ties with one of their um, their ranches down in Texas, like it's just a domino effect now that this has been brought out and now that it's actually being taken care of and like held, people are being held accountable now and I think more people are going to start saying, oh yeah, I have to resign because I was a part of that and that's what I have to do so I don't get in trouble. But I hope that all of these people that were involved in any way, shape or form do get the full force of punishment. Any last Definitely. thoughts on that? Um, just personally, I want to, I guess, just know that I am thinking about the victims and I just hope that they get the truth and they get the judgment that they deserve. And you know, it's sad, I was reading um, one of the women who spoke at mm -hmm. his trial and afterward, she said after she read it, she didn't quite feel relieved. She wanted to, but it still stuck with her. Um, and I feel like that's going to be a, the majority for a lot of the women. Mm -hmm. So just um, knowing that we are thinking about them and that it's such a terrible thing that they went through. Well, thank you for coming on with me and speaking about this today. And thank you all for taking a stroll down the lane with Delaney. Let's head over across the bridge to Royce and Taylor on the couch. Thanks, guys. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll have our tech and entertainment news to keep you in touch with everything. And Three Point Park superstars talk about how they rock DC. What does that mean? Only way to find out is to stay tuned with Daybreak. Spending just seven minutes climbing stairs each day cuts your risk of a heart attack in half over 10 years. Sure, elevators are convenient, but you burn twice the number of calories just going upstairs than you do while jogging. Think about how long you spend waiting for elevators. The average person spends the equivalent of two years waiting for elevators over the course of their lifetime. Don't let that be you. Save time and increase energy. Next time, take the stairs. I tell these guys all the time to stick to talking sports and not playing sports. Here we go. Ready? Ah. <sighs> Didn't make it. Berger here with your timely tech news. Yesterday, Samsung announced that the new Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus smartphone will launch February 25th. 
Set to be unveiled at the Mobile World Congress gathering in Barcelona, Samsung has kept a tight lock on the actual specs of the device. However, according to Tech Radar, the phone is rumored to have a 3000 and 3500 mAh batteries respectively and will include significantly upgraded cameras. Both models are set to have internal specs a little different from each other, so the S9 will feature 4 gigs of RAM and your choice of 64 or 128 gigs of storage, while the Plus model is to ship with 6 gigs of RAM and your choice of 64, 128, and 256 gigs of internal storage. The phone is projected to hit shelves by mid-March. This week, Apple announced their addition to the Home Assistant mar uh, excuse me, addition to the Home Assistant market with the Apple HomePod. The wireless speaker powered by Apple's A8 chip is set to hit shelves in the United States, UK, and Australia on February 9th. Apple representatives say the HomePod is a magical music experience as it's loaded with six microphones, a woofer, and seven separate tweeters all designed by Apple. The 7-inch speaker will also have a spatial awareness ability so it can adjust to the setting of your house for the best sound quality of that space. Apple also said that the multiple speaker systems can be placed in the room and it will create an immersive music experience. Pre-orders went live today, and the speaker is priced at $349. In other news, the European Union recently hit American tech conglomerate Qualcomm with a fine of $1.2 billion. The EU says between 2011 and 2016, the company paid Apple exclusively to use their chips. Representatives say this violates an antitrust law, as no rival company could effectively compete with the monopoly, no matter how good that product would be. The agreement between the two ended with the creation of the iPhone 7 when the Apple began using Intel chips. In a statement on their website, Qualcomm says they strongly disagree with the decision and they are looking to appeal the fine. Now over to Brianna now. That's your tech news. Let's see who's in the entertainment spotlight. Thanks, Robert. Award-winning comedian and actress Monique is asking you to stand with her and boycott Netflix for color bias and gender bias. Netflix asked Monique to appear in a comedy special with Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, and Amy Schumer. However, Monique discovered that Netflix offered her significantly less than what they proposed to her co-stars. When she approached them as to why there was a difference in pay, the company stated, quote, Well, that's what we believe Monique will bring, end quote. The comedian didn't believe it was fair that she wasn't receiving the same pay, so she took it to the media and asked her fans to join in and boycott Netflix. After the video leaked over social media, fellow comedian Wanda Sykes also mentioned that Netflix did the same thing with her. Sykes said that she was offered less than half of the $500,000 deal that was given to Monique. Netflix has yet to answer why they are not giving these African Americans their equal pay. And over the weekend, former Disney star Bella Thorne was kicked out of a hotel for smoking pot. Thorne and her gang checked into a hotel room after the Sundance Film Festival and they were seen carrying multiple bags into the room. Shortly after they checked in, it was detected that someone in the room was smoking marijuana. Thorne and her entourage were immediately thrown out of the room. According to Fox News, Thorne called out sick for her press interviews and didn't show up the next morning. However, the following day, the 20-year-old was able to appear for a photo shoot for her new movie, Assassination Nation. Back to you guys out the couch. Well, thanks, Brianna. Coming up after the break, we have an interesting segment yeah, here with yeah. some of our Point Park University students. Superstars. Who took a, superstars, <laughs> rather, who took a trip down to D.C. last fall for, the pre, for President Trump's inauguration. This and more coming up. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Head to the lab and forge it with fire. Just imagine everything it could do. It could leak pollutants into the soil and water, or it could conserve energy, cut CO2 emissions, and reduce raw material. Recycling is more than cutting waste. Recycling is about the legacy you want to leave. Why on earth would you want to do anything else? Recycle. Don't throw away our chance at survival. Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. I'm Josh Krupp alongside Jess Patterchak. Tonight we begin with the mayor is continuing to deal with the challenges the city is facing. But tomorrow we have just a little bit of cloudiness. We have off throughout the day with some strong wind gusts. That's going to continue tomorrow. 20 teams have already started talking to free agents. Saturday is partly cloudy, but 70 degrees? Where is the pool at? I mean, come on. Uh, you might have already burned your bracket, ripped it up. I am Royce Jones. And I am Casey Hulian. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. That's your news tonight for 
UView Television is live here at the Center for Media Innovation with a very exclusive interview with Point Park's Black Diamond, our school mascot. We're taking questions on our social media at UView Television. Our first question came in from at Point Park U, Black Diamond. They want to know what is one thing you love about Point Park? UView. UView. Ah, I, I knew it. UView is the best. It is. All right, Alex, you want to read our next question? Okay, we have another question from Point Park Cab. They're asking, when is the next time you're going to make a surprise appearance at their next event? Ah, uh, he's being coy. Looks like we're going to have to show up yeah, to I the event. Yeah, we'll, I guess we'll I guess we'll have to see. All right, that's all we have for right now. But you can submit your own questions at UView Television, and we might read one of yours after the break. Welcome back to Daybreak. Today we have Alex Popichak, Emily Bennett, and Josh Krupp on the show to talk about their experience at the presidential inauguration of Donald Trump that occurred around the time last year. That's right, Taylor. It's been about a year since this inauguration, and I want to jump right in with you guys, starting with you, Alex. How did you guys get this opportunity to go down to Washington, D.C. for this? Well, for that, I, I will, of course, uh, defer. Uh, Josh Krupp was uh, instrumental in getting us uh, into Washington, D.C. and with the support of deans. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure the process, but I do remember we had a, uh, a fairly comprehensive staff amongst uh, all three of our media outlets here mm -hmm. on campus. I, I don't know if you can yeah. elaborate anymore. It started like back in February of 2016. I was editor of The Globe at the time, and I was throwing out all these crazy ideas of doing a live election night show and going to the inauguration to cover it live. And as we got closer and like we started the new school year, it, it was only like two weeks into the year that we started planning. And at that time, we all anticipated we would go cover Hillary Clinton okay. getting inaugurated. And so we got thrown a little curveball and the preparation was all the same. Our hotels were already booked before election night even happened. And yeah, it was thanks to the deans and a couple of crazy kids throwing out some crazy ideas. <laughs> now, what challenges did you all face while covering this event? Well, from a logistic standpoint, you have what? We had uh, a total of like 21 people in some way, shape, or form attached to UView, WPPJ, or The Globe okay. in some way, shape, or form going down to, uh, to Washington, D.C. I think 13 of us were on that shuttle with the official, you know, delegation and everything. Uh, so there, there was a logistical consideration of where do you put everybody? You don't want everybody right next to one another. And we kind of spread out over uh, across different areas, depending on what we were interested in covering and also what needed covered. And I, I remember vividly uh, a couple of nights before we sent out this massive PDF of, okay, you go this direction, you go that direction and, and see what there is to see. Because we didn't know what was going to happen right. that day. So right. we, we were supposed to be ready for anything. Right, and you guys were down there for one of the most controversial inaugurations to date. So can you kind of relive that for us? Um, there's a lot of standing in line, <laughs> um, getting up uh, when it was when the sun had not come out yet. Um, right. And as Alex mentioned, we really did kind of have to rework um, what the story was going to be and, and what we had to prepare for because we had kind of all accepted in our minds that it was going to be a Clinton presidency. And so we kind of had to approach it in a very different way. And there were a lot of students um, that they were having a lot of difficulty separating uh, their emotional reaction and how they felt that uh, a Trump presidency would affect their lives from their work. And so we kind of just worked on that um, and how we felt that we needed to um, approach the situation as objectively as possible. Um, and it was drizzling rain and we waited, we were talking earlier trying to figure out how long it actually took us um, to get in to the line to get in. Um, and it was, I think, collectively about um, three and a half hours of just standing and waiting. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was challenging in a lot of ways, but rewarding. More and than you talk controversial, too. There were a few students that were on the trip that were like, I set on covering protests that broke out. And there mm -hmm. were a few protests with only a few hundred people, but those were the things that caught headlines mm -hmm. during the aftermath of the inauguration. And the cameras, of course, were all there to cover the couple hundred people. For the most part, it was very peaceful. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when we were inside, and funny enough, the next day, Sean Spicer goes on his rant. There were a few the Trump supporters around me that said, oh, man, I thought there would be more people here. Yeah, so did I. So they were <laughs> kind of surprised with that afterwards. 
I went and got some dinner with a few other people and fell asleep in a food court. And I woke up to texts <laughs> and phone calls, are you at the protest? And I'm seeing the pictures that our people were getting. And there were only a couple hundred people there. So while it was controversial, I think the entire day and the entire event went pretty smoothly and without yeah. incident. Well, how specifically did covering this event help you all as journalists? I mean, there's nothing quite like covering something of this scale uh, on, on, a national, uh, on a national level. It's not every day and it's not every group of students that even get this opportunity to be sent by the university to go and cover an inauguration. So um, from, from my standpoint, I consider myself incredibly lucky to, number one, as a history buff, that's huge to be able to see that. But uh, also on, on a broader scale as a journalist to be able to cover a national story localize it and, and, and work from there and, and figure out how to take your bias out and those kinds of things. It was a great exercise in, in how to do all of that. Vocalizing it was fun because there was a marching band from the area that was down there and I was talking to a few dozen people in the crowd and I was like off on my own and that's what you got to do when you're covering some of these things is talk to strangers and we talked to people from Texas, from Alabama, from Ohio and I just happened to say to this one woman, uh, where are you from? Like, what brought you out here? Oh, my daughter's in the marching band. I want no part of this inauguration. <laughs> I said, oh, can I do an interview? Said, no, I'm not really, you won't get some good words from me. So <laughs> the challenge journalistically was getting out of your comfort zone to talk to people in an unfamiliar setting that either may be very for what was about to happen or very against it and just there to see the daughter playing the marching band. Right, and what was the energy amongst the people who were there to see President Trump be inaugurated? Uh, I mean, what was the energy like between them? I'm sure I, we were speaking earlier and they were dressed in some interesting outfits, you said. Yeah, um, there was a fellow that, that we uh, interviewed. Um, he showed up in a blue blazer, as, as blue as your blazer, <laughs> and it had embroidered uh, stars like uh, like an American flag. I mean, this, this guy was fully decked out and all Americana, really, really pumped. Yes, to be at the inauguration in general, but to be at Trump's inauguration. And then there were also, you know, folks that weren't that excited, but also wanted to be there just to see the spectacle. Mm -hmm. The spectacle uh, was interesting in and of itself. And there was also, um, there's a lady that we have a picture of uh, who had these dolls. We don't know why she had these dolls, but they were all dressed up in Americana too. Um, it was it was a very patriotic, very weird pep rally kind of atmosphere is how I'd describe it. Yeah, it was, it was very patriotic when we were, because when we interviewed people, we were asking them kind of like, how, the, how they felt the environment, um, like how they were feeling or what the vibe that they were getting from the people that were there. And we got lots of answers, but from the people who um, were Trump supporters, they were saying like, we feel like so American, like we are so patriotic right now. And so that was something, and I think that people kind of look for something to like be um, like involved in as, as a mass. And so that was definitely something that um, was a major vibe there. All right. Well, I think you guys should all be pretty pr proud. I mean, this is a huge accomplishment as college students to go down there and to be able to do something like that so it's yes, exactly very exciting well thank you very much for coming on the show today we really appreciate it thanks, thanks for having us <laughs> all right all well. right you guys well it looks like that's it for daybreak make sure you tune in next week for the news you need i'm your host royce jones and i'm your host taylor fife hoping your news is good news